Good morning, folks. John Adamson with See No Evil. It is snowing. Or at least it was. It was coming down lightly when I walked out the door this morning. It was a beautiful sight. Having grown up in New England, having some snow is, well, it's kind of cool. And we hardly get any here in Virginia. Supposedly back in the day, the people that have lived here for a while said they used to get some snow, but in later years, recently, we've hardly seen any. Occasionally, we'll get a good snowstorm, but down where we are, we're about 30 miles south of any significant snow line, and so we're just spared it. I would like to see some more. I know my kids would, although when you live down a mile-long dirt road, that can be hazardous. I'm not here to talk about snow. I'm here to talk about the intersection of religion and politics. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the word of the day, which is not related to anything that I'm going to talk about. But the word is the word innominate, I-N-N-O-M-I-N-A-T-E. I just spelt that without looking at it. It is an adjective, and it came about from the Latin in the mid-17th century. It means to be not named or classified. So here's some examples of the use of the word innominate. The forthcoming book was still innominate, but had already gathered positive reviews from critics. Here's one, and I'll just make it up right off the fly. My last biological child was born innominate, and it took us most of the day to figure out what his name was going to be. Anyway, it's still in use today, not highly popular. It was popular towards the late 19th century, which, by the way, means the 1800s, in case you're wondering how that works. I'm sure that you knew that already, but you felt like saying it. What is the verse of the day? It's actually more than one verse, and it was related to the sermon that we listened to yesterday, which was actually quite outstanding. The presenter of the sermon comes across as kind of dry and monotone, but I really appreciated what he had to say. And some of the best sermons, really, I've heard have not been great orators. They've been people that really poured their heart and their mind into the subject, and you could tell because it came out as a cohesive whole. And that was the case with this particular sermon. And I actually, I liked it so much. I emailed, it was one of the elders at the church we attend, and I emailed him to let him know that I really appreciated it. But here's the section of scripture. It's from Matthew 16, and it starts, I'm starting in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And part of the message was about the fact that we have a God who is revealed in Scripture very specifically. And in this case, Jesus Christ is being identified through the power of the Holy Spirit by Simon Peter as the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, the one who is to come and pay for, pay the wages of the sins of mankind. So, great, great section of scripture, great message. I won't try to do it justice by summarizing it right now. I just got a chunk. That was kind of nasty. 
So I put some keto creamer in my coffee. I mean, it's not terrible, but you know, when you're not expecting it. So I put keto creamer in there and you know, it's of course low carbohydrate and, but it, it doesn't tend to dissolve well. Well, I took a swig and I got a chunk. A couple little chunks at the top. Anyway, I want to talk for a moment about Rudy Giuliani's star witness in the Michigan hearings related to the uh, voter fraud that's going on. Her name is Melissa Carone, C-A-R-O-N-E. She's she's really the only witness that's really made the news. And anyway, uh, for various and sundry reasons, uh, she's been called a Karen. You know, I'm growing weary of that term because it's being overused by everybody. Like, you know, you know how some people get on a joke and they'll just use the joke till you're like just sick and tired of it. Like the joke's funny once or twice, but then it just on and on and on. And you're just like, all right, let's move on from that joke. And so everybody wants to call her a Karen, which of course is a female who complains loudly about things and typically makes a, a jerk of herself. And I will admit she did not comport herself well during the hearing. Uh, you know, people are picking on the way she looks because she did her hair up in a certain way and it looks like she just threw it up there as she was heading out the door. Some people said she sounded drunk. I don't think she sounded drunk. I'll tell you, here's her basic story. She was an overseer. She's an IT expert. I mean, she was contracted, so she must have some expertise to oversee the use of these voting machines. And there was a protocol to be followed, and she knows the protocol, and she observed it not being followed. And she said that basically batches, every time that the voting machine got jammed, which is something like two to three times per hour, the protocol of was to discard those ballots that were already scanned. And what she noted was people were running these things through, you know, eight, nine, ten times. That's what she says. That's what she alleges. And she's sworn under oath and she's signed an affidavit, which means that if she's lying, she could go to federal prison for up to five years and, and or face fee, fees, fines. Um, so this is a serious thing that she's done by stating these claims. Now, she came across as kind of hostile, edgy. She uh, gave it back to the people from the Michigan, I'm guessing, state legislature who are, uh, you know, asking her these questions about the, the election fraud. And anyway, she um, is being reamed in the... Uh, in the, in the press, I'm, I'm, suddenly I'm slowing down on my speech. I need to pick this up. So anyway, there's been lots of witnesses, and she's not the only one. But for whatever reason, you look at Rudy Giuliani's star witness, or witness, and she's the one that's going to show up. Because they're going to focus on her because she particularly looked bad. But here's my thing. I have a tendency to believe her. And why? Even though I don't particularly like the way she came across... She didn't comport herself very well. Why would I believe her? Make sure I didn't get a chunk that time. I believe her, one, because it's, even if somebody's a little bit batty, they're not likely to put themselves at risk for going to federal prison by signing an affidavit. She clearly understands that because during the testimony, she articulates that. Uh, number two, She's talked about how she's lost friends and jobs uh, in this job over this situation. I believe it. That's verifiable. Nobody has said anything in the news about that not being verified. So with that said, she's faced pro persecution related to her stance. So not, not many people are willing to do that, even people that are kind of confrontational. Like she is. You know, people still want their friends and they want their jobs, certainly. So I, I believe her from that standpoint, too. 
Third, they're making a lot of big deal about how she comes across as being emotional. Think about this. You're being brought before some of the most powerful people in the state, in this case, with one of the most famous lawyers in the world next to you, Rudy Giuliani, in an extraordinary situation where you know you're going to get press and you're not used to perhaps that kind of scenario where you're front and center with a lot of eyes watching you, you're going to be a little batty. You're going to be perhaps look disheveled a little bit. You're going to say things that make you sound like you don't know what you're talking about. You're going to have trouble finding words once in a while, like we all do. And, and so you're not going to comport yourself very well. And this is a case where I believe this lady is truly authentic. She's just not a great communicator. And she's very stressed out. And that will cause anybody to come across as kind of a, a jerk, emotional, etc. So I think her claims need to be investigated. And there are other witnesses saying the same thing. And that's the thing. Biblically, and I, I, this is part of our, it's part of something I was listening to the other day. When there are two or more witnesses to something, biblically, that was meant to be a fairly solid case. That's why it's so important when Jesus was tried, two witnesses came forward to testify to what he was teaching. Now, they were there for malicious reasons, but the that was Jewish law. You had to have at least two witnesses, and we have a lot more than that in these election fraud trials. So with that said, I'm willing to believe Melissa Carone, and uh, I hope for her sake that after this is done, she gets some help because she is obviously clearly under a lot of stress. All right, what I'm going to finish up with today is last night I decided to, before bed, do kind of a free-flowing thought. You know, just kind of go from one thought to another and see how it would flow related to this whole COVID lockdown thing. And so I just started typing. And so I'm going to just read what I typed last night before I went to bed. And we'll see what kind of associations we've got here. For some reason, movie theaters came to my mind. So uh, here it goes. Movie theaters have been drastically less used or closed, delaying movie releases or preventing them, which has reduced the number of jobs for teenagers who would normally work at movie theaters doing things like getting you popcorn, likely leading to production, a decreased demand for popcorn, which would mean less corn production or more corn production for ethanol, which is really only safe in modern cars, which car sales are down because people are out of jobs and holding on to their cars longer, which may in turn have a positive impact on mechanics. So they have more work. But if you're like me, since COVID shutdowns, you've been doing more work on your car, such as changing oil yourself. Though if people are doing less driving, of course, oil prices drop and less demand for oil occurs, which impacts places like Pennsylvania, which relies on the fracking industry, which requires massive machinery to perform the jobs which are built by people who work on factories, which make things like heavy equipment and cars. Which reminds me that the brand new F-150, Ford F-150, perennially, perennially, the number one auto sold in the United States is way underselling because there are not enough people to work on building it because the company has to reduce work hours. So people are checking out other options for vehicles, which means that local restaurants in areas where the plants that produce the vehicles are less likely to, are likely to be much less busy, therefore laying off their wait staff and cooks who already likely weren't making very much money and therefore are relying on government assistance. And you could go on from there. So anyway, I just decided to do this kind of like free flow. Here's the ramification of this and here's the ramification of that. And one of the things I realized early on when we had the shutdowns 
you know, initially they were saying how travel was restricted and certain industries would be laid off. But folks, the whole economy really does depend on other aspects of the economy. And you cannot shut down just one sector and expect it won't have down the line impact on everything. And so we might have started off with things like uh, restricting restaurant gatherings and shutting down air flights, or at least people shut themselves down from that, without it eventually catching up on everything. And that's why it's so essential to open up the entire economy at one time, because if if you don't open up certain things, you're going to have supply chain issues. So, for example, we have a washer, clothes washer, that's been out for two and a half, three months. You want to know why it's been out for two and a half, three months? I'll tell you. Because we can't get the part that's produced somewhere that was originally told that we could have it within two weeks. We're still waiting on that part and no end in sight. So I've been doing my laundry over at the laundromat, which when you have 14 people in your house, I mean, we would have to do that once in a while anyway, because one washer wouldn't keep up very well at home. But at least it wasn't all the time. And now we're going weekly with huge amounts of laundry because we have nothing we can do at home. Supply chain. Problems caused by COVID shutdowns. One sector of the economy causing problems in the other sector. Of course, the guy that owns the laundromat, probably happy. But you know what? He's got several machines out. I wonder why. Probably because he can't get parts. And eventually we won't be able to go there. (laughs) Because you have too many machines out. Anyway, I just want to end up with that. I'm going to get going. I hope you have a great day. Take care and God bless.